All right, I'm delighted uh, that next up we have Jonathan Williams, who will be talking to us about PyTorch Lightning, uh, which is one of the most popular tools layered on top of PyTorch that is very commonly used in applied AI work. Um, and going through how you would work with PyTorch Lightning for a computer vision application. So without further ado, uh, John, take it away. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. So my talk will be touching upon building convolutional neural networks or CNNs with PyTorch Lightning. So the three main learning goals that I want viewers to take away from this lecture are the following. I want you to learn how to stream large data sets with the hub module. So I'll touch more upon this later, but when working with machine learning projects, you often have to work with data sets that are much larger than you could ever hope to download to your local machine. And so a way to size that, that issue is to stream data, is to only access the parts of the data that you need dynamically. And so we'll learn how to stream large data sets using the, the Python hub module. I also want you guys to learn how to fine tune a pre-trained convolutional neural network. So fine tuning a pre-trained network is basically taking a network that was previously trained for some other task and then slightly adapting its architecture so that it can now be effective for your downstream task, whatever that may be. In this case, we'll be um, fine tuning the ResNet 50 model that actually won the ImageNet competition in 2015. And the third main learning goal I want viewers to take away is learning how to train and test a convolutional neural network in both PyTorch and PyTorch Lightning. So we'll kind of see the difference between using vanilla PyTorch versus using the wrapper module PyTorch Lightning. So firstly, the hub module. So Hub is a Python module used for streaming large data sets. So as I mentioned before, when you're working with big projects, sometimes you'll have a data set that's like 100 gigabytes, 200 gigabytes. This is much larger than you could ever hope to download to your local machine, unless you're using web services, but that's a whole, that's a whole other can of worms. So in order to subvert that um, heavy memory cost, we have to use, we have to somehow dynamically only access the parts of the data that we need to train and build our models. And so Hub is a very useful framework for doing so. It's very useful for just streaming large data sets. It also has some built in uh, visualization, visualization um, softwares. And it, it very easily integrates with the two major machine learning frameworks, PyTorch and TensorFlow, which is another reason that um, it's used quite ubiquit ubiquitously. Another major benefit of Hub is that it offers um, very easy application of pre-processing transformations. So a lot of times when you're building models, you can't just use the raw data that you're given. You have to alter it or pre-process it in some um, fashion. So it's very easy to pre-process your data using the hub module. And now I'll touch upon the actual modeling objective that we have um, today for our convolutional neural network. So today we'll be using the NIH chest X-ray 14 data set. And it's a public data set of over 100,000 chest x-rays, and they were collected from around 31,000 uh, patients. And that the entire data set is over 45 um, gigabytes in size. It's a very big data set, and I don't see a lot of space. It's um, hard to download, so that's why the that's we're using the hub module, as I mentioned before. And each chest x-ray is assigned um, zero or more of uh, up to 14 possible conditions that are listed over here on the right. There, we'll touch more upon it in the, in the notebook, but one chest X-ray can have either the zero, the healthy label, or can have up to 14 of these disease labels. And the goal today is to construct a vision model, so a convolutional neural network, to predict the diseases that are associated with a chest X-ray. And so this task is a multi-label classification task. So, we should really touch upon and draw the distinction between a multi-class classification task and a multi-label classification task. So the classic example for a multi-class classification task is like cats versus dogs. So you feed uh, CNN thousands of images of cats and dogs and it can output, okay, is this image a cat or a dog? The critical word there is for, an image cannot be both a cat and a dog. So each image is, um, it belongs to a singular class and no other class. Whereas in a multi-label classification task, one single image can belong to multiple classes simultaneously. 
So you can see how a multi-label classification task is um, fundamentally harder than a multi-class classification task. And so our CNN will have to adapt to this harder uh, context. And the pre-trained backbone for our CNN will be the ResNet 50 model. So it won the ImageNet uh, competition in 2015. And the, the main contribution of ResNet are these residual connections, which are highlighted by these black arrows here. The core idea being that if you have these residual connections, they take in the input image tensor, they feed it through a convolutional, through a convolutional block, and they concatenate the same image tensor before it was went through the uh, convolutional block with after it went through the convolutional block. The reason being is that if you have this flow of the tensor before the convolutions and after, it allows an easier uh, flow of gradients through the model. So if you just have a default, or not default, a vanilla model where you have all these layers stacked back to back to back to back to back, it may lead to a phenomenon called exploding or vanishing gradients, in which the actual rate of changes of our air with respect to each, each of these parameters, they can explode as they um, go back through this model, or they can vanish as they go back through this model. So to subvert that issue, we use these, these residual connections. So having these residual connections, it makes it easier for the gradients, um, for the for the gradients deeper in the model to uh, receive updates. And the, the, the idea behind these residual connections was, was kind of groundbreaking at its time and it helped it win the ImageNet competition in 2015, where an ImageNet competition basically is a multi-class classification task in which one image has to be assigned into up to 1,000 different uh, possible classes. And the main, so we have to discuss, okay, how are we going to determine the efficacy of our model once we train it? And the main metrics we'll be using today are precision and recall. So imagine we have some text classifier and all the possible documents that we want our text classifier to flag are highlighted by the teal boxes and these light purple boxes. The relevant documents are highlighted by the teal documents. So the two main metrics we'll be using today are precision and recall. So recall can be thought of um, can be thought of as what percent of relevant items are we actually flagging by our model? And this for this you know, imaginary classification task, box in yellow are the documents that our model flagged as being relevant. And so you can see that we're only flagging nine relevant documents of a total possible 18 documents we know are relevant. In this case, our recall would be 50% because we're only really pulling 50% of documents that we care about. Precision is of the documents that we flagged as being relevant, what percent actually are relevant? So it's highlighted here, we flagged 12 documents as being relevant, but only nine were actually, actually relevant. So 60% would be the precision of this model. So often when you're building models, it's kind of a tug and pull between precision and recall. As you make your, as your model, as you force models to have a higher recall, precision often drops. Whereas, you, as, whereas as you force your models to have a higher precision, recall often drops. So there's a tug and pull there, but these are the two main metrics we'll be using today. We'll also be using a metric called F1, which is the harmonic mean uh, between a model's precision and recall, the best value being one um, or 100%. So now I'll touch upon the PyTorch, the PyTorch Lightning uh, Python module. So PyTorch Lightning is useful because it removes a lot of the boilerplate that you have to write in PyTorch in order to train a model. So as Vish touched upon earlier, when you're using PyTorch, there are some pesky little details you have to keep it, you have to keep um, cognizant of. So you have to zero your gradients. You have to move images and labels off and on of the device. You have to set your model to train in eval mode. These are these pesky little things that you know lead your code to sometimes have errors where there really shouldn't be. So by removing that kind of core boilerplate. It helps keep your code cleaner, bug-free, and it's, it's a better development um, process when you use PyTorch Lightning. So you're able to prototype models faster and not worry about, okay, did I actually, am I going to run out of GPU space because I made a silly little error? It's also easy to implement. It's also easy to run your code in different hardware. So let's say you have a, let's say you have a single script and you want to run it across multiple GPUs, for example. Um, if you were running that model in vanilla PyTorch, you would have to undergo a pretty major refactor in order to you know, train that same model across multiple GPUs or on a different TPU, for example. With PyTorch Lightning, your code is hardware agnostic. So you can run the same code across many different accelerators and it will still run perfectly fine, which is 
very useful when you kind of scale up your models to train on bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger um, data sets. And we'll touch more upon it briefly when we get to the actual live coding portion of the lecture. But PyTorch lighting removes a ton of boilerplate that you must write when you're using PyTorch. So for example, I mentioned the model training, moving um, data on and off the device, zero ingredients, stepping forward your optimizer, all those you know, the little details are abstracted away by PyTorch Lightning. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the main, um, I guess, section of the slides. So now we'll hop into the live coding portion of the lecture. John, there's a question about uh, precision in the graph being nine over 12. Yeah, let's see, so is that the wrong number there? Yes, or yeah, that's a thank you, Ahmad. That is an incorrect figure from Text IQ. Yeah, thank you for catching me. Can you see my collab notebook? Yep. Okay, so in chat, if you if you got the notes about the very beginning in the document, you'll be able to um, access everything. So the slides and both notebooks I'll be writing for today. So you can just click on the second link in order to access this notebook as I type up the, um, the code for today. So I mentioned that we'll be streaming our data from Hub, which is the uh, major framework. Let me connect to the runtime actually. Let's connect. Great, okay. And make sure Hub is installed. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, Hub is now installed. Let's clear output. So the main data set we'll be working today is the NIH um, chest X-ray 14 data set. And so I'm just importing Hub here and I'm importing two main um, functions we're gonna be using today. So the split function will split the data that we import into a testing and a training portion. And the shuffle function will be used to actually shuffle our data set. So in order to ensure that we're not introducing any biases into our um, into our model, we're going to first shuffle everything before we um, before we uh, begin to train our models. So this line, we, we're actually loading the data, the data set, and we're going to print a summary to the console. We're going to shuffle the data set in order to avoid any biases before we train and test our model. And we're only actually going to work with 1% of the possible data set. This is just out of the interest of time. So recall that we had over 100,000 um, training and testing images from the NIH data set. And I mean, you, you can run that, but it will take a very long time. So for the sake of time, we'll only be using 1% of that for training and testing our model. Let's run this cell. So I mentioned that um, the hub module had some, some built-in visualization software. So we can actually inspect it over here. It's very nice. Let's sign in, I guess. Okay, can I sign in? Okay, let's look at the data set. Great, okay. So I want to only look at the image, the chest X-ray and its associated findings. So this is a built-in feature of um, Hub. It allows you to just dynamically look at all of your chest x dynamic look at your data set and its associated labels. So if I click on this chest x-ray, for example, I can see that, oh, too far, zoom too far, zoom out, let's refresh. Can I zoom out? That's tragic, let's see. Um, John, a comment on the code, if you could make it a higher font so that it can be seen better. Okay, yeah, let me, let me zoom in. Is this, hopefully this is better. I think so. I think if you hit uh, view zoom um, um, on the on the Chrome settings on the right, if you can increase the font size, I think that that will make sure you can keep scroll. Yep, there we go. Yep, so here are some examples of chest x-rays and associated um, labels that had the 
asset solitis and infiltration labels. So you can down, you can visualize your data very nicely using Hub. Let's come back to the code. And so this summary function, it prints out just a summary of the data set. So we can see all the tensors that are contained within our data set object. We're retaining only 1% of the data set. So this line just retains only 1% of the available data set. And then we're testing and training, splitting it into 70% training and 30% of testing. So we're going to be training our model on 605 train images and testing on 260 um, test images. And so a critical thing we must take account for when building these models is patient overlap. So some patients, they could have a chest x-ray both in the train set and a test set. And we shouldn't actually train a model on the same patient's x-ray. That's kind of, a, that's, that introduces unnecessary bias into our model. So to do so, this little function here, it filters out data sets. It filters out all the patients that were in the train set and removes them from the test set. So now our test said that I see 251 images instead of 260 because nine patients were already present in our training set. So now we're gonna go over um, the actual pre-processing that we must do in order to properly build our model. So to do so, I'll just print out or I'll plot an example um, image and it's associated disease label. And the 14 labels that I the chest, are, are the 15 possible labels a chest x-ray can have are zero, no finding, or one through 14 of possible disease conditions. So this is importing the matplotlib library. This is the library common to many different applications. It allows you to plot figures. I'm just gonna parse uh, of a chest x-ray from a random index, let's say, I don't know, 42. We're gonna pull out that images actual image array, we're gonna pull out that images label and we're gonna print both to the console. So let's run this cell. So this is a chest, this is a chest x-ray of a, a healthy patient because it had disease label zero. So we're just printing it and it's really good often to analyze your data in this manner before you begin modeling. So you don't make any erroneous errors. Um, I guess kind of a funny story for me is that um, I found it useful to plot these images one time while I was working on a project because I didn't know that the actual zero, zero coordinate for these images is the top left corner. I did not know that, but by working around and by exploring your data, you'll catch silly little errors like that. And so we have to, I mentioned before, but we have to pre-process our data before we can feed it into our model. And so we'll pre-process each image as follows. So we'll convert it to a tensor, we'll resize to 256 by 256 um, pixels, and then we'll normalize. So there's more details about this, about why we chose these specific um, pre-processing, pre-process steps in the notes file. But to give a high level, you know, thousand foot overview, we first must normalize the pixels to be in the range of zero to one because it makes our computations faster. We resize each image to the same 256 by 256 resolution because all our images must be the same size in order to feed into our model. And then we normalize all images to have um, the pixel distribution of a normal a normal pixel distribution value um, because it makes your computations just faster and more efficient and speeds of training. But if you want to dive deep into that, I've linked some um, nice articles in the notes file uh, here, here, and here. Okay, so let's begin with our pre-processing steps. So we got to import Torch. So Torch is the backbone um, you know, framework behind our pre-processing steps. And this is our pre-processing class for the images. So let's dive deep into this. So when we're processing the images, I create um, uh, actual class and I inherit from the NN.module um, superclass. I have to import, I have to, I have to set a pixel mean and pixel standard deviation. So we have to remember, I, I, we have to normalize these images to have zero mean and one standard deviation. So you have to incorporate the overall pixel mean and standard deviation across all the images from our data set. And then we also incorporate a field called desired image size because we have to resize all our images to be the same 256 by 256 image size. So this is our forward function. And our forward function will actually take in an input image and it will convert, it will apply all three pre-processing steps. So first we take the image and we only take its first, its zeroest, its zeroth image channel. All images are grayscale. And the reason we do this is that there are some issues that crop up sometimes with some, with some images having um, more than one channel which doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, your, your entire code will crash. So just add a sanity check. I only take the first image channel. 
because all our images are grayscale chest x-rays. We use the Torch Vision uh, library to, we use, we use the Torch Vision library because it has some built-in transform functions that will help our transform process. So this tensor function, it um, normalizes pixels to be in the range zero to one, and we apply it to our input image. Similarly, this dot resize function, it will convert our image to be of size 256 by 256. And then this normalize function will um, force the actual pixels in our image to have zero mean and one standard deviation. And then we actually return the image copied over the same image copied over three different input channels. The reason being is that our ResNet backbone model, it takes in um, RGB images that have three different color channels. So in order, for, in order for it to work with our grayscale pixel, with our grayscale chest x-ray images, we have to feed it the same image copied over the three different image channels representing like the R, G, and B. So let's run this cell, name it, and oh, let's run our, this cell and then this cell. Okay, that works, good. And then let's actually create a image, an image transform um, object. We can um, explore how the um, preprocessing will affect this example image that we began with over here. So this cell simply, this pixel mean and standard deviation, these are values that I actually computed for a, a very similar project working with chest x-rays. And so these values are, these, these values were pulled from that project, the mean and standard deviation. If you're working with your own project, you should definitely write a script to just iterate over all the images, compute the pixel mean and standard deviation. Um, because by working with your specific data sets, mean and standard deviation, you'll get the best results. And then recall that we're resizing each image to be 256 by 256. So they be include that field into our, uh, our transform object. And so let's see, how does this transform actually affect the first image that we are working with. So as you can see, this image has become a lot blurrier and a lot um, you know, more pixelated. Reason being is that the main, the core reason behind that is that, okay, we had to resize the image to be 256 by 256. So you're gonna lose some resolution when you're compressing the image um, in that manner. But it looks like our pre-processing is working for the image, which is good to see. We didn't make any mistakes, it was good. Okay, so now that we have our code to pre-process the images, we have to pre-process the labels as well. So in order to pre-process the labels, we have to um, convert each label to a tensor. So we're working with PyTorch, and as just mentioned before, PyTorch, the, the, the language of PyTorch is tensors. So we can't just have, we can't pass in a list of, a, a list of you know, numbers to PyTorch, it has to be a, a tensor. And we'll create a hot encoded tensor of shape one by one row by 50 columns. So a hot encoded tensor basically means that it'll only have a one at the index where um, the, the chest x-ray had that disease uh, label. It'll become more clear once I give an example. So let's pull the code for creating our hot encoded label. So in this field, we just um, include a field for the number of classes that we're working with. So because we have to know how, lo how long our tensor uh, should be. So we convert the input label to a tensor and then we convert it to a hot label, a hot, a hot encoded tensor by using the built-in functional dot one hot um, uh, class from Torch. And then we, then we return our hot encoded label. So now we'll actually build out the, um, the transform object. So we are working at 15 possible classes here, recall because we have the zero class, which represents healthy. We have the 14 other classes, which represent um, the various disease states. We have 15 total possible classes. And so now we have our pre-processing object for our labels. So we had the example label from before. Very, it's, very, it's up here, let's see. Where's the example label? It's right. It's right here. So the label associated with this chest X with this chest X-ray was zero, meaning this is a healthy X-ray. So in our hot encoded vector, there will only be a one at the zeroth index. So we have one followed by all these zeros. And so we pre-process our labels like this because in order to back propagate the prop model, we have to include at the very end a vector of shape one by 15. So that's the core reason that we pre-process our labels um, in this manner. So now we have to create our data loaders.
this import function, this psutil.com, dot, this psutil, it's used because it allows us to increase the number of workers in our um, data loader. And so what if I a batch size? I found 64 to work well for this task um, just by working a little bit beforehand a couple of days ago. And Hub is very useful because it has a built-in function to create the data loader. So before, if it's just talk, when we were working sometimes with, with, um, with PyTorch, you have to actually create the data set class and then wrap it inside data loader. Hub has a built-in data loader class. So you don't have to actually wrestle with those kind of minute details of building out the dot get item and dot length of functions, which is very nice. And we actually are automatically applying our transformations to the data as it streams in. So now we're creating our data loaders and that ran fine. Okay, good. And so now we're going to create the entire CNN in PyTorch. And we're going to import the pre-trained ResNet model, which will take some time to download. So let's download this. Great. Okay. ResNet is now downloaded. And so now we'll have to actually construct the CNN architecture in PyTorch. So let's do so. Before we do so, actually, I want to actually quickly print out ResNet. Let's see, can I print this out real quickly? ResNet, ResNet. It's a very big model. At the very end, it outputs a vector of a thousand. Um, of a, of a, it outputs a vector of a thousand. Um, so, to fine tune the ResNet model, we'll take that one thousand vector and we'll feed it through a shallow fully connected neural network at the very end. So, let's delete, delete this cell. And so let's build out our CNN. So once again, we inherit from the NN.module class and we just super up some, um, or we reconstruct our, when we're, we're making our CXR CNN object, we have to include the number of outputs as an instance variable because we have to know how many output cells we should have at the very last layer of the um, CNN. So we're gonna save the red that model that we just downloaded as a field in our CNN object. And we're going to save the number of outputs. And we're also going to save the fully connected neural network as a uh, field. So we're going to feed the output of ResNet, which is that 1,000 uh, that one thousand long tensor. We're going to feed it through a neural network that has 1,000 nodes to 500, 500 nodes to 250, and then 250 nodes to 15. And this four pass defines, okay, how do we convert an input image into that final um, tensor of length one by, of shape one by uh, 15. So we first, we pass that input image through our ResNet model and we get out the tensor that's a thousand, um, that's, that's, that's a shape one by 1000. And then we pass that output at ResNet tensor through our fully connected neural network. So basically this is an example of uh, fine tuning a pre-trained network because we're taking the deep, the vanilla ResNet model we're attaching a shallow fully connected layer, and then we're transfer we're transferring all the knowledge that was gained by ResNet for this downstream classification task. So let's run this cell. Cool. And there's this very useful package I use quite often called Torch Summary, and it allows you to see how tensors are actually transformed and how they flow when they are processed by your model. So let's actually see how a tensor flows through our model. So our, our input image size would be three channels and then 256 by 256. Um, so we're gonna see how the input image will be processed by our model. So we get out of this big reading input and a, a good reason why I like to use torch summary is that you also get to see the parameter number on the right side. So you get to see kind of where the parameters are blowing up, or not blowing up, just getting larger and larger in your model. So this first main, big outprint, out, this first main big cell of outprints you see are just the weights and parameters in the architecture of the ResNet model. It's a quite a big model, it's 50 layers deep because of the name ResNet uh, 50. So it's a very big readout. And then we get to the output layer. So the output of ResNet is this tensor that's a thousand units long. We take that tensor, then we feed it through our fully connected neural network of 500 neuron to 250 to 15. The full network has 26 million parameters and it's quite large. Let's see, almost half a gig. 
So it's very interesting. Okay. Good to see it's working. And so now we have to create the loss function. So recall that we're performing a multi-label classification task. So one image can have many, can belong to many different classes simultaneously. And so the main, or not the, the proper loss function to use when doing a multi-label classification task is the binary cross entropy with logics loss. This is a loss function from the Torch library. And um, when you're actually constructing the um, BC with logics loss object, if your classification task is imbalanced, you should include some positional weights. So these weights basically are related to how under or over represented a class is in your um, classification task. So, you know, ideally all classes would be represented about the same throughout all samples. And then your model could perform, you know, pretty well because you would know that it's seeing all classes at about the same at the same rate. But often that's not the case. Often there's some imbalance in the relative frequencies of classes that you're predicting on. So, for example, the healthy class was by far the, um, I should explain the, these, these numbers actually. So these numbers, I iterated over the entire data set and I computed, okay, how many occurrences of healthy did we see? How many occurrences of state one did we see up to state 14? And there was some major imbalance. For example, the healthy disease label had the highest occurrence of around 36,000, whereas the disease label of one had the, you know, by far the lowest account at 99 occurrences only throughout the entire data set or throughout 70% of the data set. And so in order to account for that imbalance, we include these positional weights. So classes that are underrepresented are given a higher weight, whereas classes that are overrepresented are given a lower weight. So let's run this cell. And so the class weight tensor kind of reinforces what I just said. So whereas the most overrepresented class of zero is given a low weight of 0.7, this very underrepresented class of class one is given a weight of 611. So this forces the model to really, it really punishes the model for incorrectly predicting um, an underrepresented class. Now we create our optimizer for our model. So we're using the Atom optimizer. It's a pretty default optimizer. It works pretty well across many different tasks. So we'll use it here. And then we'll actually run our training loop. So when working with Torch, we have to make sure, we would be very careful here because you don't want to make any, you know, Silly errors that may account for me just not being careful with your code. So let's the, let's run, let's turn our model for two epochs or epoch and arrange two. Let's do the following. Let's do let's iterate over all images and labels in each range. for batch index. So what we're doing here is that we're iterating over all of our data and our training data loader. And so we enumerate because I want to keep track of the batch index so I can print out periodic updates to our console. So we'll unpack the images and labels as data from the batch our images and labels because our batch size of 64. So we're unpacking simultaneously 64 images and their associated labels. Then we have to, we're gonna have to actually push the labels to the GPU. So we're gonna do images, comma labels. We're gonna push these images and labels to the GPU. So dot CUDA. So now we have pushed our image and labels to the, G, to the GPU. And before we predict our model, we should clear the gradients that were previously computed. So we clear gradient. Zero grad. So it's clearing the gradients that were previously computed by our optimizer. So we can make sure that when we are computing a model, when we're computing our loss this iteration, we're not, you know, computing, we're not gonna back propagate incorrect gradients. Then we have to pull out model predictions. So pull out model predictions. Turn to predictions, equal model on images. This simply the tensor now of all the predictions your model made on these on this input image batch. They have to calculate the loss. So 
Did we create a loss function? Yeah, we did, we did. Here we go. So loss function is called loss underscore fn. So let's calculate loss, calc, loss, loss equals loss function of predictions. So to calculate loss between your predictions and our labels. And we have to actually, as Vish mentioned before, when you're looking at the loss, you want to make sure that you detach it from our CPU, from, from the GPU, so you don't run out of memory. So we're going to do batch loss equals loss dot detach dot CPU dot numpy. We're going to actually update our batch loss log because we want to somewhat visualize, okay, how did our model learn over all the batches? So we're going to update our batch loss log by appending to it the current batch loss. And then every couple, uh, let's say every fifth index or every fifth batch, I want to print to the console um, our current batch loss. So if batch index mod five equals zero, or sorry, our batch index plus one, Modify because I because I, I don't want to print the zero um, loss. I'm going to print the following. So I'm printing the epic is training batch and then the loss. And then we got to clear our gradients and back propagate. So let's do the so now. Clear gradients and back prop. So lost that backwards. Optimizer dot step. Okay. So hopefully this runs without me. Error. Hmm. While it's loading, I'll go over the code for the visualize, visualization. So we're just going to print out, we're going to plot a uh, just a bar graph of how our models um, error changed over the different training batches. So this plot would just, the X value would be the, the, the batch number and the Y value would be the actual, the loss at, the, at that if batch value. And this cell would just be running our model inference on the test set. So I kind of breathed over this before when we were building our model out, but our model is not, does not output a, we, we don't apply an inaccuration function onto the output of our model. We simply return these things called logics, which is the raw output of our model. So in order to actually gain a, a prediction for a model, we have to run that output layer through an activation layer. In this case, the activation function will be the sigma activation function, um, not softmax. Softmax is when you're doing multi-class classification. Sigmoid is useful for, for multi-label. And while, let's see, how is this going? Okay, we're almost, we're making some progress here. While this is cooking up, let's write the code for the testing loop. So with, with torch, uh, no grad. This function simply disables um, unnecessary gradient computations while our model is, let's see, lost that backwards, didn't work. One second. That backward. Backward. To work now. Okay. So that's kind of another example. You should make silly mistakes sometimes when you're working. You have to account for, you know, backward stepping and um, zero ingredients. But that's all abstracted away when we work with high torch lighting, which is coming up soon. Um, so this cell will just run our model inference on the test set. So let's break this code out.
or images and labels and the tested loader. We want, we want to do the following. Let's push the images to, let's push the images and labels to the GPU. So push and then push. So images and labels. This is I mean, it's the same code from before. Let me just copy it actually. There we go. So we push the images and labels to the GPU. And next we're going to actually update, we're going to run the um, images through a model. So run images. Predictions equal the model and the images. And next we have to gain with the run the predictions through our sigmoid activation function. So next we'll say predictions equals sigmoid predictions. And then we need to, because we're gonna keep track of the predictions in this list, we have to detach the predictions from the GPU. So we're gonna do predictions equal that detach that cpu.numpy. This entire function, let's copy that. Next, we have to update our prediction list. So we'll take our prediction list. We're gonna say the predictions list equals plus. We're gonna have this cute little list comprehension here. So we have, we want to make sure that for every cell in our array, if the value is less than 0 0.5 after the sig after we apply sigmoid, we want to squash that to zero. And if, if the value is greater than 0 0.5 after we apply the sigmoid, we want to increase that to, to one. The reason being is that our hot encoded label only contains zeros and ones. So we want to make sure we're kind of matching the, the, the formatting that we decided upon earlier. And we've updated our predictions list. So now we need to actually update our labels list. Update labels list. Let's see, is it running? Okay. So labels. Okay, so our model train, which is nice. So this was, the, this was the model train batch versus training loss. So it's very erratic here. It decreases kind of slightly. The reason is to be expected because we're using a very, we're using 1% of our data and it's a very hard task. So if you actually want to see like a nice smooth decrease, you have to use more data and train it for a higher epic number. Um, which you can experiment with because this, this code is on is all in collab. So you can experiment with actually using, you know, 10, 20% of data. And then you'll see um, how the model, the model precision accuracy just increases as you let it run for, for longer and longer. But out of the sake of time, let's actually see the output of the model on the test set. And then we'll use um, the classification um, the SQL from this library called Scikit-Learn that allows us to predict, that allows us to output a classification report kind of seeing, and it allows us to see the per class precision and recall of our model. So we can see, okay, for what classes does it, does it do well and for what class does it perform poorly? John, uh, on line 22 in the previous cell, did you mean to add it to the predictions list? Yes, let's see, so this is do this. I think it does. Let's see. I guess we're gonna see if it doesn't work. Prediction list, it's predictions list plus. There we go. Let's see if this works. Let's see, did it? Run through. Okay, cool. So we were able to run through our, um, we're able to run through everything at least for one run, which is nice. And thought of performance, let's see, a weighted average of F1 of 
0.16. So it performs very poorly, but as you increase that trading data percentage that you retain from 1% to 5 to 10, this numbers, these, these numbers do increase. Okay, so now let's actually write the same model, but in PyTorch Lightning. And you'll see the differences about how using PyTorch Lightning makes your code a lot more robust. So the main, a lot, a good thing is that once you write a model in Torch, converting it to PyTorch Lightning is relatively seamless. So we have to actually just import or just write cells that contain our image preprocessing code, our image slash labels. Okay, so we can actually, this code has already been written for us. We can actually copy and paste it from this notebook. So we have our class hot encode labels, just copy and paste. And we have our class preprocess images, which we can also just copy and paste. And next we have our class weights um, argument that helps um, enforce, you know, equal representation among the among the um, classes when our and uh, in, in our loss function. Let's incorporate that as well. Where is it right here? Let's see. Here we go, class weights. Let's run these cells. Oh, too many sessions. One second, let me terminate this other session because we're done with that. Let's connect to GPU. Sometimes, sometimes you're working with Colab, you have to make sure you manage your sessions properly or else it will give you GPU access. Um, so just make sure that, that if you're trying to work with multiple notebooks, only actually have a GPU running on one and have your CPUs running on the on all on all, on all the other ones. Okay, let's see, does it work now? Great, okay. So let's make sure that we have all the pertinent packages installed um, for our um, for our, for our, like, um, the lecture. So we need, to, we need to install hub, high charge lighting, and the weights and biases. And while that's loading up, I'll just kind of go over the framework of building out, um, a model on PyTorch lightning. So once again, we have to import the Patreon ResNet. So this cell is literally the same exact cell we had before in our PyTorch version of the model. Now in PyTorch Lightning, there are a couple of functions you must put out in order to train your model. The most pertinent one probably being the forward function. So, okay, let's see everything's installed. So let's clear the output here. Let's run this cell to see if all our imports will work. Now let's reset the notebook one second. Restart runtime. Okay, good. So now we had to, that was a quick just error. Sometimes you have to restart your runtime or to make sure your imports function properly. But this cell, this import, this import the preaching ResNet, ResNet cell, that was the exact same cell that we had before. So it's very similar to what we previously done before. But now here's the main difference when you're creating the model in PyTorch Lightning versus vanilla PyTorch. The most important function we have to specify is the forward function. So it kind of defines how an input image tensor X is processed by our model. Then we, have to, we, then we also have to write all these all, all of these auxiliary functions. So setup, for example, setup defines how is the data um, set up and downloaded and you know modified for our model. We have to define the train loader and test loader. These two functions simply define how do we return a training data loader and a testing data loader from our um, for our model. We have to configure the optimizers. So this function simply just helps. Whereas before we configured the optimizer just one in a, in a one off cell. This function defines okay, which optimizers are we, going to use, are we going to use for this model, and how do we configure them within one modular function? We have training step, test step, and test epic end. So training step defines okay, how should we process an input batch? How should we process the input batch during a training run? 
test that test step similarly defines, okay, how should we process the IF testing batch during the IF run? And on test, Epic N simply defines, okay, after we've iterated all of our over all of our testing batches, what metrics we compute in order to define, okay, how well did our model perform on the test data set? So let's first write out some pertinent class attributes. So we, in this model, I've defaulted the batch size to be 64, and I've defaulted the learning rate to be this predefined number that we already used, and the retaining fraction to be 1%, because we're only using 1% of our data because we're you know, pressed for time, only, after, and only an hour lecture. But if you want to experiment with running on more, just change this argument to, have, to, to be a higher percentage. They're gonna save these pertinent attributes, these pertinent you know, arguments as class attributes. And then we're gonna hard code some specific, some specific attributes that are um, data set specific. So we're, we're working with 15 outputs. Let's define that as a, as a um, constant, our pixel mean, standard deviation. Oh, standard deviation. Here we go. We're gonna define our image transform and our label transform as just simply being instances of our um, pre-processed images in our hot and cold labels function. So now we're gonna define our PyTorch model. This code is you know, very, it's literally the same code we already written. We have, we, def, we save the resonant as a, an argument to our object, and we save the fully connected neural network as an argument to an object. And then similarly, we're gonna save the sigmoid activation function because when you're working with the raw logits, you have to apply sigmoid in order to gain the actual prediction. And we're gonna save the loss function, which is the BC with logits loss as a class attribute. And then we're gonna save these lists of predictions and labels um, as class attributes. So at the very end of that test epic end function, we can parse out the um, classification report. So this cell, the forward cell, is the exact same as what we had before. So we take in an input image, we pass it through ResNet. We pass it through ResNet. We parse out the logs that it, we pass this input. So we first take in our input image. We pass through ResNet. We pass the output of ResNet through our fully connected neural network, and then we return the logits. Next, we have to define our setup function. So our setup function defines, okay, how do we download our data and split it into train testing, such and such. And we've actually already written all this code before. So we're gonna string the data set with hub. We're gonna string the data set with hub. We shuffle. We only retain 1%. We split that 1% into a 70% train, 30% test. We account for patient overlap. And then we save our training data set and our testing data set as class arguments. Similarly, before we've already written the code about, okay, how do we define our train data loader? That code is dropped into this def train data loader function, which returns the train loader for our train set. So the arguments, the transforms we're applying are the self.image transform and the self.label transform, which are um, defined in our pre-cross images and high encode labels classes. Similarly, for our testing data loader, we have to define um, the same as the same as like the same as like arguments before our testing set. So we define that here. Next, we have to configure optimizers. So we're using Atom, as mentioned before. Atom works pretty well across many different tasks. So we're going to use it here, and we're going to set the running rate that Atom is going to be using to. To the, to the saved learning rate from four, which is 2.5 um, e to the minus four. So we're using this um, inputted default argument, which you can work with, you know, you can work with altering it because learning rate is a very um, important hyperparameter that's used for, um, you know, if you change learning rate, you could very well change the efficacy of your model. So that's also another fun thing to experiment with if you want to do so at a later time. So the most important function perhaps is this, or one of the most important part, one of the most important functions is this training step function. So before we have, remember before, recall how we had to unpack images and push them and pull them from the GPU. Now we don't have to do that. We simply just say, okay, images and labels are gonna be unpacked from the IF batch. We run the images through a model. 
we calculate loss, we log the loss, and then we return it for that propagation. So building a model with PyTorch is a much more, um, a much, much easier, much more pain-free, much more pain-free process, if that makes sense. Similarly, we have our test that function. So we unpack the images and labels. We um, pull up, we parse out our predictions, we parse our labels, and then we update our predictions list and our labels list. And at the very, very end of testing, we want to print out the classification report uh, to the console. Cool. So hopefully this all runs. Great. So now we want to actually create our, our PyTorch lightning model. So we created it here. And we're going to use checkpointing. So Vish mentioned before that sometimes when you're building a model, you want to, or actually all the time you're building a model, you want to use the model that performed the best on um, across the validation set. In this case, because we're not using a validation set, we're only training and testing, we want to use the model that performed the best on the training set. So which model had the best, the lowest training loss? And we'll save those weights and actually call upon them, um, call upon them for inference when, you, when we're going to test our model. We're setting our max epics to two because in our previous notebook, we also only used two epics to train our model. And now we're going to actually train and test our model. So training the model is useful because we have this useful trainer function. So in this trainer function, we can, oh, that undefined find resonant, let's see. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, now we can do this. But this trainer function is very, very useful because you can, control many different arguments. So for example, I can control the, the number of GPUs I want to train this model across. I can control the max ethics. I can control which logging I want to use and how often I want to use my logging. And I can control, um, I can control, um, what is, I can control the actual checkpointing callback. So which, which checkpoint I want to use or to um, test or to test my model at, 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 testing, at testing time. Um, so it's very useful to include this training argument um, because, um, because it allows you to control many of your arguments. So I included more about it in the slides and the, um, and then the actual accompanying notes, but the training argument in Python Lightning is very useful because you can control the, the very minute details of your, of your model. And so now we should wait for it to train and load. Let's see. Also, I want to say one thing before the lecture ends is that sometimes you get this error message about your iterable data set has been defined. Um, this error is very annoying. So if you're ever trying to work with multiple GPUs, you have to account for that. You actually have to rewrite uh, the len function of your um, data loaders. <coughs> oh, my neck. Ooh. So let's see, just waiting for it to train up. Okay, let's see. So a downside of sometimes using Colab is that you're not guaranteed the same GPU um, that you used that you used before, for example. So this cell is actually going to take 47 minutes to run, whereas my previous cell took like three minutes to run, which is not good. So I have to end the lecture here. Um, but if you want to like look at the output of this model. Uh, once it's done training, you can just look at the look at this notebook from the, the accompanying slides. 
right here, just the, just the third link. It's gonna take some. It's gonna take some time to finish. Some time to finish, but if you look at the output, it'll it'll be there once you're done. Um, but yeah, I think I can end it here actually because I just gotta wait for the model to train. Um, but I hope you learned a lot about using High Torch Lightning. Excellent. Thanks, John, for a fantastic presentation and for covering uh, this tool and how to go about actually coding it up. So thank you.